m'associer, vous, vous associer à moi pour souhaiter une cordiale. I would like to wish a warm welcome to Micheline Claudon and Ariane. They are going to make a presentation and so I only have to hand over to them. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words. I'm Micheline Claudon. I'm a clinician psychologist. I work at Hôpital Bichat, Claude Bernard in Paris. And I've come with Ariane to show you, uh, to tell you about our experience in expert patients. Uh, you know that uh, this is something that's uh, starting to be very fashionable. It's something that we started more than 15 years ago in Hôpital Bichat. And I'm going to, we are going to present this experience with expert patients to you this morning. I'm going to tell you how a therapy group can uh, really uh, help to train um, expert patients and uh, uh, caregivers. And then uh, I hope that there will be a discussion with the room. So I indicated that the therapy group is a place to educate. Uh, patients. You know, uh, therapy groups, you always encourage patients to go there because you tell them it's good for them. You know, I, I came to Hôpital Bichat <coughs> some time ago, and very soon I understood that I had the duty to take care of people who were addicted to alcohol, and I didn't know how to do it. One of the first alcoholologists at the time was there, Dr. Malka, and he said two things to me at the time which were completely revolutionary. The first thing that he said to me was, of course, you don't know how to do this because in your psych psychologist training, uh, you were taught to wait until patients express a demand. And you know the problem is that if you wait until they ask for something, they will die. And so we had the first liaison teams where we tried to anticipate on patients' demands and expectations. Second thing is that I came to realize that I couldn't work without patients. And so this therapy group was, of course, meant for patients, but also for caregivers. And then inside the therapy group, we had what we called expert patients that Ayan will tell you more about later because she was one of the first expert patients that I had to deal with. Back to the fundamentals of uh, support groups. You see that this is something that started back in the 1900s. It was for patients with TB who were set aside from society and so they would meet with their peers so that they could talk about the same thing. And one of the main functions of support groups today is uh, to get rid of the denial and to have identification with other people, similar people. So we imposed uh, therapy groups during hospitalization. This is part of the contract that we deal with patients, and you will see how this works. Conditions to have access to a therapy group, it can be contract obligation, as I just said. We can talk about this. I will tell you why we decided to make uh, attendance obligatory, compulsory, so, uh, you know, when somebody asks to be hospitalized, even if they ask to, 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 to be uh, helped by a psychologist or psychiatrist, we ask them to go to a therapy group and patients have to sign the charter. It's a commitment on their side that will enable us to remind them that they've committed themselves to attending the therapy groups and that they commit themselves to also receive expert patients and meet with them. It can also be a recommendation uh, or a referral. You know, somebody, uh, we, we more and more receive patients who are referred to us by uh, colleagues, by doctors um, who uh, were involved in the support groups and who say to the person, you should attend because I've learned a lot from that. And then there's also freedom because after being forced to attend, at some point the patients decide to come or not. You know, we have four therapy group meetings per week. One of them is only made up of patients coming from the outside. We've got 40 people meeting every week. So you see that people, uh, maybe they're forced at first, but then they see the benefits of it and they come of their own free will. <coughs> so we have three steps. The pre-group, uh, we have a very nice environment for that because we have a room, a cafeteria, which is uh, close to the group meeting room. And so in a very informal way, the most senior people welcome the new ones. And this is done in a very natural way. And sometimes we ask our expert patients to um, go and greet new patients who seem to be a little bit at a loss. And it happens very naturally. And so when you join the group, you are reminded of the framework and instructions for each support group meeting so that we can actually make up a group and so that we can have a group spirit so that we can um, enunciate the instructions 
So at the end of the group meeting, uh, we uh, decide the topic for the next meeting. Let me tell you what the last uh, topic was for our meeting. It was very moving. It was the stories I've been telling myself, you know. So it was very funny. The patients were playing the game, and uh, as usual, and you know, I patient said, I was telling myself the story of one class and one only, you know, I told myself the story of I'm drinking because I'm enjoying being with friends or the type of thing, social drinking. <coughs> so you can't see this here, but this is the hospitalization contract for cessation. And I've underlined here the obligation to attend the support group meetings. We ask the patients, of course, to read the contract. We explain it to them line after line. and. This enables us to uh, refer to it when patients um, challenge or question their attendance to the group meetings. You know, this is this is pure clinical practice. You know, for years and years, even in the liaison groups, I never imposed anything. I didn't want to force the people because I thought that for ethical reasons, you have to 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 warn them that the liaison team is going to visit them. So, I told the people, please t warn the patient in advance that they're going to have to see the liaison team, and so you. Can can imagine the result. What was the result? Well, the patient wasn't there. The bed was empty. The bed was empty because the patients did not want to see an addictologist. So something that was supposed to be based on ethics actually defeated the purpose because the patients did not actually have the freedom to meet with uh, future expert patients. So in a support group, People say, people think that they're supposed to talk. Well, this was really a question that we had to ask ourselves. You know, first of all, if you're interested, if you want to create a support group, you will see throughout our presentation, we're going to tell you how good this is, how uh, much of a good idea this is. But the question is, do I have to talk? Well, I think Ariane and myself have a very clear answer to this. No, let's not go around the table. Don't take turns because the people are, feel a lot of anxiety if they know that they will have to talk. You know, because a lot of the questions that we get is, am I going to have to talk? Because they have to attend already. So that's an obligation. So very, very clearly, we said that there should be no obligation to talk, no tour de table, you know, and some patients even some expert patients say that they spent several months or even years without talking, just attending the group meeting. So is uh, talking a good indication of the work that is done? Certainly not, because we see patients who say that they take a lot from the groups without contributing by words. So, but it's very interesting to see what the patient uh, remembers after the group meeting and to have a, a debrief session so that we can come up with tools that will be suitable for each. And during the uh, group meetings, every person can give their opinions or uh, say that they want to attend another activity or uh, be uh, involved in the outside world, etc. So what's the point of all this? Well, first of all, it's uh, the education to freedom. When you join a support group, you see yourself in somebody else's eyes. You see the freedom that's possible there. And seeing yourself in somebody's eyes will enable you to dare to be free. But it's not only that. It's also accepting your uh, um, addiction. You know. People, I usually say, you know, uh, both in group meetings and individual interviews, your problem is that you're not only addicted to alcohol, because I mostly deal with alcohol, but your problem is that you're addicted to the way other people see you. So the support group is also a place to uh, experience this, to experience some uh, information, to be trained. And a lot of us working with alcohol addiction, we hear a certain number of things that people say that they don't say with other addictions. They say, you know, doctor, I drink just like anybody else. You know, I've learned this from patients. Just like anybody else is not something that's relevant. You know, it's, it doesn't even exist. And so in the uh, group, the idea is to go get out of this idea of just like anybody else to I'm one of a kind, moving from I can't drink to I don't want to drink anymore. 
you know, patience taught us a lot of things. And then one day during a, a group meeting, I don't know if you remember this, Ayan, I think it was you who said that it's never the same reasons why you stop and why you keep on stopping. You know, you, very often you start stopping because of an order, because you have to, I have to stop drinking because my liver is sick, because my wife is uh, giving me a hard life, because I'm going to lose my job. And then today, Therapists have accepted to accept uh, the, the, the prime reason, but then we have to build on this with the patients to convert, to try, and to move from the I can't to the I don't want to drink anymore, so that patients uh, really become to own their, their strategy. It's not about control or anything. It's about accepting to uh, start the journey with your addiction. Now, an emergency plan. For those of you who don't know what it is, it's a tool which was very popular, let's say, at some point. We would uh, suggest an emergency plan to the patients, but it was mostly a relation-based tool. The emergency plan was before you go out of the hospital, you'll try to set up this emergency plan with us. Basically, you are going to give the names of uh, people who may uh, be able to help you and your addiction. So, you know, having these resource persons, as we call them, made it possible for the person to understand that we're not centered on consumption but on addiction. It was a way to, um, to, 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 to build a different relationship. So this emergency plan can uh, be interesting because people actually acknowledge that they might start uh, using again. And uh, so the model for us and for the young colleagues that I work with, you know, I say to them, you know, the day you will be able to say if something works, if it's the patient comes back and he says that the objective was too hard to achieve and he comes back to you because of that, it means that your relationship with the patient was stronger than the product that he was using. And so that it means that you've won something in your relationship. So the support group is also about um, highlighting experiences in relapse. You know, when the patient authorizes himself or herself to come back, it means that it's a victory, it's a success because uh, uh, patients come back because they know uh, that it's going to work. Integrated freedom, well, that's the freedom to leave the group because very often we say, oh, but you know, patients who attend your group meetings maybe are not addicted to a product anymore, but they're addicted to the group. And I would say, as a clinician, well, addiction to a therapy group kills much less than addiction to products, right? And plus, they're not dependent because they may come, they may leave the group at any moment, and if they come back to the group, they know that we will greet them, we will welcome them. And those who will become the expert patients have, at some point, they felt that they had a role to play to be the witnesses because their peers were asking them to give witness. So the therapy group is a place to educate the caregivers because this is where we see where our limits are. You know, it's like we were saying to the patients, help us to help you, you know. We uh, try to uh, talk and uh, the patients become the trainers and that's the expert patient. So of course, Ayan, uh, please um, uh, say anything you might want to say because it's, it's you uh, who uh, are actually at the center of this uh, system of uh, expert patients. So I'll start with a little bit of theory. We hear a lot about expert patients. We don't really know what it is. So let's say that we have a consensus. An expert patient is a patient who's acquired an expertise that was validated and that led to a degree or at least the recognition of his knowledge and therefore he can take functions or take up missions or deliver uh, teaching uh, inside and outside of the health system. This was uh, defined by uh, uh, Catherine uh, Tourette-Turgis. It took her three years to come up with this definition, so we decided that we were going to adopt it, even though, as you will see, and as Ayan will tell you, Basically, an expert patient would be more like a peer mediator or something. So the name doesn't really matter, but what matters is what is inside, what it all means. So, you know, 
we had a very uh, paternalistic model, very paternalistic approach, you know, where the doctor knows it all and he decides for the patient. In 1986, the WHO wanted to have more involvement of patients and families, and we got to the shared decision making and then therapeutic education, and then we have the Montreal model. The Montreal model, that's the one that we uh, got our inspiration from. I see you take pictures. I can send you my PowerPoint presentation. That's no problem. Please listen to the conversation so that we can then have a discussion. It's no problem. The PowerPoint will be sent to anybody asking for it. It will be on the website. Uh, for, as for my presentation, it's not a problem. I can pass it on to anybody. So the Montreal model is the one that we took our inspiration from. You know that in Canada, they are the most advanced in terms of a patient and uh, caregivers' relationships. And of course, the systems are different, but we are very close to the Montreal model because it's based on experience because it's there for both patients and healthcare professionals, and this is this is a given right from the beginning, and also because it's uh, present in care and also in training, education, and research. So after uh, our presentation, we will have to leave you, and we're sorry that we have to leave you, but we're not sorry uh, about the reason why we have to leave you, because for the first time, we're going to give a presentation to the Medical School of Paris, Paris 7, where uh, we are going to be considered as uh, teachers and educators. We've been asked to make this presentation from experts. You know, they've convinced the faculty that we have to become teachers that we have to educate them so we were rather proud, we were proud of that. So the Montreal model considers the patient as a uh, learning uh, subject who is part of a health care organization that also learns. We learn from patients and patients learn from us. So would you like to say something about this? The uh, experience-based knowledge, it was uh, introduced in mental health first. It's a whole set of specific skills that a person uh, gets when, she, when he needs to adapt because of a health problem. So, you know, we did this for patients with hemophilia or patients were, who had, uh, uh, had an amputation. And the idea is to use the, emotion, uh, the emotional capital linked to the experience of the patients. So it was a very new experience at the time, or an experiment in the area of mental health that um, gave results, which we took our inspiration from to uh, theorize what we were doing, especially using I, using the pronoun I to talk about your life and your uh, life uh, journey. So would you like to say something, Ayan? Yes. Good morning. In this uh, study that was launched by uh, CCOMS, we decided to look at how this all could compare with our experience, what we were doing very pragmatically in the field. And so there are three points that I would like to uh, tell you about, which show how we differentiate ourselves from healthcare professionals, from caregivers, as expert patients. First is distance, second is uh, bilingualism, and the third is reciprocal identification. First of all, distance. You know, as expert patients, when I get into a, a hospital room, when I go and see a patient, there is little distance, very, very little distance between the patient and myself, because you, there's mutual recognition because I am, or I was a patient myself, and because I can have, uh, um, I can demonstrate tenderness, you know, very often it's very emotional, there's tears, there's emotion, and it's not a problem for me to get close to the person, to hug the person if necessary, to uh, console her or him, so there's, there's no distance, or, well, well, there's little distance, less distance anyway than with healthcare professionals, where in French we say tu instead of vous, you know, so, of course, we adapt ourselves to what patients request, but very often it's two. And then when we say bilingualism, bilingualism, well, this, as, is, as expert patients, we speak the language of healthcare professionals, and we also speak the language of patients. That is, when we talk to patients, we speak their language, and when we talk to healthcare professionals, we talk their language, because we've been through that. And so we can do simultaneous interpretation, basically, and we can uh, translate 
what one has to say to the other. And uh, this is really important. And uh, reciprocal identification, well, we've been through the disease and through the addiction. So the persons that we visit in the hospital rooms can identify with us, you know, uh, even though it's not immediate, this person can see that there is a future just because I'm here and I've been through this before. And so my experience will, will enable him or her to hang on to something real, to something tangible. And as for me, in the patient, I see the person that I was at some point. Of course, it's not t total identification, but there is this uh, mutual understanding here, which I think is very interesting and makes much sense. So you see, for expert patients, you have them in many areas. As I said, diabetes, patients with hemophilia, um, patients who've been amputated, and you know the French culture, and so you can imagine how reluctant all the uh, healthcare teams were. You know, they say, oh no, you've got to have doctors and patients. Well, with expert patients, of course, you have the same obstacles as you would have in other areas in France. You know, people say, oh, it's a little bit difficult to have patients on our teams. Well, you know, that type of things. And plus, you have specific representations and images that people have about alcohol with, you know, you've been an alcoholic once, you always an alcoholic, you know. And so people are very reluctant. Healthcare professionals were reluctant to get expert patients on board their teams. And so we understood that we, you had to train the healthcare professionals even before you can start training the expert patients. Healthcare professionals have to be willing to get expert patients on board. Otherwise, if they're reluctant, the experience cannot work. You know, what didn't work in a peer patients was not the problem, was not a problem with patients. It was a problem with the uh, professional teams who were not ready. You cannot blame them for that. But you really, if you have to do this, if you want to set this up, we are working on um, uh, developing team spirit and uh, having expert patients working with professional teams. You really have to set the scene and you really have to train healthcare professionals to um, work with expert patients to be able to give them opportunities to work with them. And then another specificity in um, uh, addictology is something that might have been helpful but wasn't in the end. It's that very often um, you have a uh, uh, people who say in addictology departments, they say, oh, but we already have expert patients. Well, that's support movements and associations, you know. We presented expert patients with uh, Ariane to the Paris Hospital Board, and they said, oh, but um, associations have been saying this a lot because, you know, associations and NGOs, they get a list of patients but never have contacts with the teams, with the healthcare teams. So you see that there's a difference between uh, associations who work in hospitals and expert patients because expert patients are part and parcel of the uh, teams, of the medical teams, and Ariane will tell you how it works when she uh, works uh, in hospitals. So what happens? How can we work with expert patients? Well, I think, you know, one day uh, it appeared to me, a patient said to me, oh, but you cannot understand. And I said to him, yes, you're right. I can't understand. I have my own limitations. And this was a long time ago. And uh, I did as Dr. Vache en France said at the time, I called patients and I said to them, okay, tell me everything that I can't understand. And so we started off from their experience and then this is how they could become experts. But in order to do this, we need to set up trust. And, you know, uh, we have to trust our patients to make it possible for them to progress. But we also have to trust expert patients to give them their place on in, in a team. If you don't trust the capacity of the expert patients, then you don't leave them any room for maneuver, no matter what. Uh, qualities they have, of course. You know, uh, it's because expert patients uh, uh, are uh, used by the medical teams that they can enter a room. You know, as as, Ian, uh, as Arian said, we, we can tell t we can tell patients you shouldn't go out of your room because you will be visited by an expert patient, as if they had to go on an X-ray of, of something. You know, doctors know that they're not supposed to come into the room when the expert patient is there. The nurses know that they're not supposed to come into the room when the expert patient is there. So it's really supposed to be highlighted by the team. So you see, I've been very lucky because people have trusted me. My boss trusted me. 
I was there before him, actually, you know, Professor Michel Le Joyeux. He uh, uh, arrived in 1994, so I was already there in Bisha. I had already started working with patients for a long time. So he came there, he was an addictologist, he saw it was working quite well, so he said, why don't you continue? And so he um, also let me organize expert patients and so on. I'm quoting him because this was in 2007. You know his book, From Pleasure to Dependence, huh, from Professor Le Joyeux. And in his book, there was a book, uh, there's an, uh, an abstract, that show, a little part that shows what happens. You know. I know a lot of volunteers with very professional volunteers. One of them is actually helping in the hospital to um, alcohol meetings. I like to listen to him talking about his reconquered liberty and freedom. Like a best psychotherapist who tells me how precaution, uh, what, what, with what precautions he deals with his uh, peers. And we were, he's a, he's a, a pedagogue of, of freedom. This was in 2007, and already this was given us something that was made valuable by the head of the service, of the hospital service. As I told you, most important is to team, uh, to train the team, to receive um, the people. And I really invite you to go and, and, and see this because it's an incredible wealth. To train the teams, you have to identify a referent in the team. Not everyone is doing everything. This project has to be carried by somebody. It has to be conducted with associating all the team members. Everyone has to be associated, and as long as not everyone's ready to um, welcome expert patients, well, then do it. So who's doing this? Uh, who's doing? You have to just make very clear who's doing this. We did trial and error, you know, uh, function like that. And then you have to plan a time for exchange, and then just think about supervision, plan supervision. It's not complicated. We have lots of documents about expert patients, but we have to preserve them, preserve the patients. And Ariane will tell you, I mean, when a patient comes and gives a testimony of, of his ambivalence saying, well, it was easy for you, but it's not easy for me, and he's aggressive, it's not my life, it's not the same. You have to have a place where you can speak about that and let go. And it's really important to plan that time of supervision. And I'm telling you again and again, because it's most important to me, you have to go from former patients, former sick people, to healthcare partners. What we say during therapy groups, speech therapy groups, is among the, the, you know, the, the recommendations. I mean, they, expert patients, help us to help you. And they help themselves by helping us. Why do we say this? It sounds a little bit like, oh, well, they help themselves in the way that they will allow the patients to ask for help and dare do this. And so, and they say, well, we're going to disturb them. And it's important for us to tell, well, Ariane was sharing about the mutual um, identification, reciprocal um, identification. It is important to hear somebody say, well, I'm not well, I'm not good, you know, it's not going well. And today we're okay, but it's important to, at some stage, say, well, there's, you know, an appeal allows us to think about, you know, these things. This intervention has to be made very strong upstream in the team. You will receive expert patients. You know, today I'm office-based, and the patients I'm receiving in my office, I'll tell them I will follow you with a lot of pleasure. I'm always happy to support patients, but there's one condition you have to come to the therapy groups. And patients tell me, I'm going to your office. I don't want to go to hospital. That's okay. I'll find you another team, and I'll give you names. And you see, when they come to the um, a speech therapy group, you know, it's already very made strong, you know. And then what do we do downstream? Well, we interview them. So you were not ready to come, right? So what did you get out of it? Oh, they say in the end, you know, this group is not just like an um, alcoholic group, right? No, it's a group of Mr. and Mrs. Everybody. So I'm telling you again and again, there's an obligation to receive the patients by contract uh, during the cure. So in the end, specific skills of expert patients, I'll go quick so Ayan can share her testimony and she can really show, you know, and talk about her skills. You have to be a testimony of something possible for the newcomers. It's possible to be better, you know. Um, it's not about cessation, it's about quality of life, being better. It's not, oh, I quit, because maybe you can control your consumption, you can be in a good quality of life, you can talk about trust you can but why couldn't you do that as well you may consider that quitting is a beginning and not an end and you can also share the fears in the early days that we had the work of expert patients is to say well i was hospitalized and i was very scared of going out 
of the cocoon and share emotions, big, small emotions. We always feel that we can't have small emotions. And I've received an SMS that I got upset about and I want to cry and I want to consume. And then an expert patient, he knows, he can share that with you. And of course, the current technology allows to be um, joined if they consume. And SMS is a tool that is very used by our patients and expert patients. So intervention fields are caring and information. You know, there's a lot of places where they intervene. And Ariane will tell you, we were talking about justice. We had the pleasure to intervene together you know, shortly, short time ago um, in the uh, lawyer's school. And the lawyers told us, we're fed up to be punishing. We want to understand what addiction is. And I said, I'm OK to intervene, but I'll come with my expectations. And today, the National School of um, Lawyers is working with expert patients so they can train the future lawyers. The organization of care as well. Of um, Sometimes we interview our you know, we, we think about, you know, permissions, you know, uh, it's the way that the healthcare is organized. And we ask them, expert patients, to know what they think. And quite often they say, well, well, what you do is just rubbish. And they tell us very gently because they're very polite, but we understand that this is what they say. And so basically, you know, we, 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 we're going to train the students and then we uh, train a lot of occupational um, therapists, you know, occupational medic medicine. And today it takes evidence. We need evidence and we have to um, study the position of the expert patients within the city, within um, recruitment once again. Um, we are telling, you know, we cannot invent everything. Today we detect potential patients in the therapy groups, right? Quite often, they are the ones who are referenced in the individual interviews. Quite often, a patient says, I'd like to be like Ariane. Well, if I hear that from a patient, then I think, you know, identification was working. That's when we ask for two years of abstinence, good quality of life, and also satisfying social integration. The expert patients should do other things than being expert patients. And also some experience in volunteer work, supervision, HAS, which is the French Health Authority. They are very interested in this process and they keep sending new processes. And we have additional um, criteria that might be coming from institutions' expectations. If you're in a living home, it's not the same if you work in a um, consultation office in town. So those are the criteria. And at last, we were lucky, we can say, to have an agreement from the institution. So we work, let's say, you know, it's like we are local craftspeople. And Martin Hirsch recently, um, in November 2016, he sent a very clear signal message to the hospital. Hospitals should be welcoming um, organizations and patients. A hospital that cannot do this is not really a hospital, he said. So hospital would be not so complete if, it, if the hospital was not influenced by what users and their representatives can bring to us hospitals, right? So this is a validation and also it's bringing valuable, you know, value to this work. So now I'll give the floor to Ariane. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.